Um, yes, thank you for joining us for Grow Montana's 2021 in review and vision for the future, uh, part one. Um, my name is Mara Hen. I work at the National Center for Appropriate Technology at our Butte office. I am a community food system specialist uh, at NCAT and along with my work with Farmers Markets and the Harvest of the Month program, I've also been the Grow Montana coordinator since the winter of 2019. Um, our agenda today, um, we're kind of in the middle of our welcome and background on Grow Montana. Um, around 9.15, we're gonna jump into some policy presentations um, around the our, uh, 2021 legislative priorities. Uh, at 9.50 around that time, we'll have a small presentation uh, on tips on preparing for uh, future sessions and how our coalition can better position ourselves. And then a little later this morning, we'll break out into some sessions so you all can have some conversation around the topics and questions that come up today. And then we'll come back together and do um, some share outs and then just closing remarks and then we will adjourn at 1030. So um, for those of you who may be from unfamiliar with Grow Montana, here's a little background information. Uh, Grow Montana is a grassroots broad based coalition founded in 2005 to advocate for changes in state policy that would strengthen Montana's food and agriculture economies. Our common purpose is to promote community economic development and education policies that support sustainable Montana-owned food production, processing, and distribution, and that improve all of our citizens' access to healthy Montana foods. The coalition has since led food systems research, produced educational materials, and stewarded significant policy changes to support Montana's food producers. Our coalition is comprised of representatives from each of our member organizations and extends to their individual members memberships, which Grow Montana considers our allies. Our member organizations work on the state, regional, and local levels. In 2021, we've had 21 farm and food organizations work to advance our policy priorities, which included a soil health study bill, the Farm to School Grant Act bill, and the Double Snap Dollars bill, as well as country of origin labeling. NCAT is the fiscal sponsor of the coalition, and the work of the coalition is guided by our steering committee as recognized on this slide, along with several subcommittees that help move our work forward. And you can learn more about Grow Montana and our membership and our work at our website, uh, www.growmontana.org. And I'll put that link in the chat in just a bit. Along with myself, I'm happy to welcome our presenters today, Lorianne Burhop, Chief Policy Officer at Montana Food Bank Network, Ian Finch, Food Access Program Manager at CFAC, Rachel Prevo, lobbyist with Montana Farmers Union. And I'd also like to thank Gretchen Boyer of Farmhands Nourished Flathead and Jamie Ryan Lachman of Montana Organic Association for joining as breakout session facilitators later today. So with that, first up is Lori Ann and Ian with an overview and comments on House Bill 235, state investment of double SNAP dollars. And I will stop sharing my screen. I will try. I can jump in anyway. Um, I don't have anything to share, Mara. If you if you want, you can leave it up even. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Ian from CFAC, um, Community Food and Agriculture Coalition in Missoula. And it's so nice to see so many familiar faces here today. I feel like I'm speaking to a lot of friends, which is really cool. Um, and I'm here with Lorianne today. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce what the Double Snap Dollars program is and kind of where we were suited um, for doing a policy approach. And Lorianne's going to cover what actually happened this last year in Helena. Um, so the Double Snap Dollars program is a SNAP-based nutrition incentive program. So that means that we're working with 
clients um, that have been identified as eligible for SNAP, which is food stamps. And we do one-to-one -one matching for those clients at farmers markets, retail grocery stores, direct marketing farms, so that's CSAs and even farm stands. And right now we're matching SNAP funding up to $30 per shopping trip. So based off of a $30 SNAP purchase, clients now have a $60 shopping budget, kind of helping them stretch that budget so that they can feel like they can afford and um, really you know, support the local food system. And so really it's a multiple strategies where we're passing money through the local food system to support low-income Montanans. So really we're supporting families, we're looking to support those farmers market economies, and then we're also really hoping to support farmers in that process because all of the support through these benefits must go back into the local food system to local farmers. So we started in 2015 just at four locations over in Missoula. And now, you know, fast forward to 2021, we're in 27 to 30 locations across the state and working with 22 farmers markets, two grocery stores and three or four farms. Um, that's looking this year, we had uh, the highest need ever. We saw um, $96,000 in SNAP spent through farmers markets um, and other partners in the state. $73,000 in that SNAP matching program. And so around 170,000 real dollars. And depending on how you do an economic multiplier, somewhere between 250 and $300,000 going back to the local food system through this program. Uh, we operate off of a pretty large federal program that does require a one-to-one -one cash and in-kind match. And so that's why we're particularly suited to seek state funding and a lot of states um, have been passing legislation for that match and to support programs in their states, kind of even outside of that federal program. So that's what we were seeking to do. And I'll turn it over to Lorianne to kind of say what happened and what we were hoping for last session. Thanks, Ian. Let me share my screen. Visuals for you here. Um, so, like Ian said, we worked on a bill to request state funding for double SNAP dollars in Montana. This bill is House Bill 235. Uh, our 2021 effort was really building on an effort that we started in the 2019 session with a very similar bill. In 2019, the bill passed the House and then died in the Senate Public Health Committee. Um, so coming back in 2021, we had the same Senate sponsor, Senator Dan Solomon out of Ronan, who's been great to work with on this. We had a new House sponsor in 2021, uh, Tom Welch out of Dillon, both Republicans. Um, and then similar to the 2019 bill, um, our House Bill 235 had no issues in the House. We had a really strong hearing. Our first hearing was House Human Services Committee. I think we had over 20 people testify. We had a great mix of farmers, um, farmers market managers, double stamp dollar customers, dietitians, food pantries, a really good mix of individuals talking about the benefits of this program. Um, the bill made it through that committee on a strong vote, 14 to five. But at that point, unfortunately, we learned that the executive, um, the governor's office was opposed to the bill um, and leaning on legislators to kill it. The um, governor even urged our bill sponsor to just pull the bill at this point, um, saying that it wouldn't be worth the effort to get it passed. Fortunately, our sponsor decided to fight for the bill, um, but thought that it would be strategic to lower the dollar amount asked. So we went in initially asking for a $200,000 investment from the state. At this point, our sponsor recommended um, reducing the request down to $95,000 over the biennium. So just a more palatable number in a tough budget year. Um, and knowing that if we were able to get any amount through, that would be a really good starting point to build on it in future sessions. So we amended the bill um, and it made it through the house um, on a pretty solid 55 to 45 vote. It's a quick vote count here. So all Democrats voted in favor of the bill and then all of the Republicans highlighted in green voted in favor of the bill as well. Unfortunately, after passing the House, our bill was once again assigned to the Senate Public Health Committee, uh, which is just a notoriously challenging committee to get legislation through. And sure enough, despite a strong hearing, um, we, that committee did again kill the bill on a party line vote. However, this time around, we knew that we had enough support in the full Senate to pass the bill if we could just get the bill through this committee. Um, we worked with an amazing lobbyist, S.K. Rossi, to really help 
to facilitate this process to really get the inside information on which senators were willing to support the bill um, and moved forward with a blast motion, which was very exciting. So Senator Solomon agreed to do a blast, which essentially pulls the, uh, pulls the bill out of the committee that had tabled it. Doing a blast requires a majority vote. Um, so we had the blast motion there in the Senate, it passed on the Senate floor, meaning that they agreed to pull it from that committee that had tried to kill it. The bill then went to Senate Finance where we squeaked through on a 10 to nine vote and then went back to the full Senate for a third reading and passed third reading 27 to 23. So we got the bill through the legislature. That was an incredible accomplishment. It was a tough year. It was, um, it was a challenge the whole way and we did it and we were really proud. Um, but we knew that we had a pretty real veto threat looming as our final step. So then we shifted advocacy efforts to really try to focus on the governor's office. Um, we did a sign on letter with more than 70 organizations delivered in person to the governor's office, um, shared on social media, statewide earned media, really trying to raise attention to this bill, to the importance of the program and to how this is now going to hinge on the governor's decision. Um, unfortunately, the governor vetoed the bill, um, which was disappointing, but not surprising given his opposition early on. Um, here's the veto letter. Essentially, the stated reasons for the veto was that he felt this bill was a duplication of existing federal initiatives and noted that additional SNAP funds had been made, been made available to families throughout the pandemic, and he encouraged SNAP families to use those additional funds to support Montana, Montana growers. Um, so that was our bill in 2021. So now thinking next steps for 2023, I'm really trying to think through how we can build on that amazing work and success that we've had and the progress that we've made in educating legislators um, and really trying to connect the dots of food security, local food systems, producers, affordability of local healthy foods, food access for families on low incomes and try to bring that together in some sort of legislation. Um, one possible option that we're considering is based on a model that a number of other states have implemented that essentially invest state dollars in a fund um, that allows food banks and food pantries to access money to purchase local foods and to invest in infrastructure to allow them to purchase local food more sustainably. So things like cold storage and transportation op options and really help facilitate um, connections between those pantries and local growers that could potentially build on and contribute to the work that Hobo Mountain and the Local Food for Local Families Coalition is doing. Um, but definitely at this point, just looking for input, ideas, suggestions, recommendations. So we'll, we'll stay in touch with Grow Montana on this and try to figure out what makes the most sense for everyone and how we can be helpful in the next session. Thanks, Lorianne and Ian. Um, we have a couple minutes for any like initial questions from, uh, from the audience. Feel free to take your off, yourself off mute. Um, or put them in the chat. And if we don't get to all of them, we can definitely reach back out to you after the session as well. All right, doesn't look like there's any questions. Again, feel free to put anything into the chat. Um, you can review that later. Um, I'm going to take it from here to give a quick update on um, one of our other uh, policy priorities from the session of uh, the soil health study bill. Uh, this was SB 180. The soil health uh, sub subcommittee bill was sponsored by Senator Pat Flowers. Uh, it aimed to appoint a soil health task force to explore how the state can promote and support farming and ranching methods that improve the health of our soils and the yield and profitability of agricultural lands. The bill was introduced in the Senate Natural Resources Committee and passed executive action. The bill moved to the Senate floor, but was unfortunately not passed and indefinitely tabled. SB 180 was the first soil health bill proposed in the Montana legislature and was, has led to larger statewide efforts to continue supporting producers in soil health. Uh, Grow Montana worked with Cole Mannix as our lobbyist this year, and he, he worked uh, very closely on, on this initiative on this bill. 
Uh, Cole couldn't be here today, but I met with him last week to get some of his insight. And he shared that out of our many supporters on the bill, we only had one opponent, which was grain growers. And it seemed that their main objection was that they perceived this bill as a redundancy of work that's already happening in the state. Cole's sense was that the biggest challenge in passing this bill was not having strong enough relationships with mainst mainstream agriculture, and that that is something Roe Montana should focus on developing for future sessions. But the upshot of this bill is that it stirred up a lot of conversations and uh, motivated the conservation districts to move from a neutral stance to supportive of soil health. And out of that working group that developed this soil health study bill, there is now a Montana soil outreach initiative being led by the Montana Association of Conservation Districts, Montana Watershed Coordination Council and other partners, several of which are Grow Montana members, including uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council, NCAT and Northern Plains Resource Council. Um, from September of 2021 through July 2022, the Montana Soil Outreach Group is reaching out across the state to ask what more might be done to su better support farmers and ranchers in managing soils in Montana. The purpose is to increase the pace and scale at which land stewards implement voluntary practices and systems to maintain and improve soil health. In August of 2022, the group will produce and share a report on what was learned along with any recommendations that seem to, that seem to emerge. Um, participation is encouraged and more information can be found at their website. I'll drop that in the chat in just a moment. Um, there you can participate in a short survey or reach out to Cole Mannix directly with the email that's listed there. Uh, exploring soils at macdnet.org to schedule a time to talk with him directly. So uh, I'll put those in the chat and any questions I can try to answer. Um, I didn't work very closely on the soil health bill, but I can also follow up with any of those questions afterwards. Uh, this is Robin um, from Aaron. I just want to say that they are going to report out uh, more on that project uh, um, at the Expo Sunday session, 3 to 4.30, and I'll put that information in the chat along with the registration link. Yep. Thanks, Robin. So there's that uh, website where you can learn a little bit more about that um, about that project, and also here's Cole's email. Oh, oh, did I just send them to you? Sorry, Robin. Whoops. <laughs> it's like defaulting to sending to you. Um, all right. Well, I will read you that, and if there's not any questions, I will pass it over to Rachel to talk about Cool. Thanks, Mara. Let me get my screen shared here. Okay, so for those who uh, don't know me, my name is Rachel Creville. I'm the lobbyist for Montana Farmers Union. Um, we worked on two cool bills this past legislative session, um, country of origin labeling, and they were something that was supported pretty widely, um, but unfortunately were not successful. So I will dive a little deeper um, right now. The two bills were House Bill 324 and Senate Bill 210. The main sponsors on the House bill were Representative Frank Smith and Representative Willis Curdy, and then the sponsor on the Senate bill was Tom Jacobson. Um, I'm happy to drop those links afterwards if anyone's curious about specifics on the legislative website, um, but I will just leave it there. So what did COOL set out to do in Montana? So basically, we're looking at how can we get a label on Montana beef and Montana pork and just pork and beef in general with country of origin labeling. So these are just five ways that country of origin labeling does affect our communities and it's really important to food security. I really do encourage you to check out foodsecurityforus.com and I'll drop that in the chat after my little presentation. Um, there's a lot of great information there. So basically the cool label, there's cool on most food products basically except pork and beef. And so we can have foreign imported beef 
labeled with like a product of USA, as even if it wasn't born, raised, and processed here. So we were setting out to have two label or placards, I should say, at the retail level. Um, one saying like imported or origin unknown for that we, that was not born, raised, and processed in the U.S. Um, or having a born, raised, and harvested, processed in the U.S. label on that beef and pork on that retail store placard. So that was the gist of the bill. Um, the House bill actually died in the House Agriculture Committee and then was also unsuccessful following a blast motion on the floor by the sponsor. And then the Senate bill was on the table in the Senate. Um, so both of them were done in committee at the most part. So we're supporters and stories with, I'm gonna just stick with House Bill 324 for the sake of time. Um, they were very similar in supporters and, and stories, but we had quite a few folks testify in support of the bill, including Northern Plains, Montana Organic, uh, Montana Cattle Association. We had consumers, we had ranchers from all across the state. Um, there were stories about being able to have, you know, the power of information when it comes to feeding family, and then ranchers talking about, you know, giving an accurate and honest label to beef and pork, um, and credit where credit is due, as Montana ranchers do raise some of the best beef in the world. Um, and just an example of statewide support from the legislative report, there were 423 phone or web messages in support of the bill and only seven against. Um, and that's not including any, like, personal texts or calls to the legislators. Um, individually. So what's next with COOL? It's not over. It's definitely not over. Right now we're actually seeing a pretty exciting federal push with a bipartisan push for mandatory COOL from Senator Tester, Thune, Rounds, and Booker. Um, and that while this is specific to beef, it's country of origin labeling for beef. Um, so mon visit MontanaFarmersUnion.com. Um, we have a little bit more information if you're interested in contacting senators and our congressional delegation. Um, so that's where COOL is at right now. And then I just have a few little screenshots with a little more information based on the bill that um, is happening in Congress. So happy to drop any of those links in the chat if anyone's interested in more. But that was Montana Farmers Union and mandatory cool in the session. So I will stop my share. If anyone has questions. All right, if there aren't any questions, I will also give a quick update on uh, the Farm to School Bill that Grow Montana led on in the session. Um, the Farm to School Bill was HB 642. It was called the Farm to School Grant Act Bill. It was uh, sponsored by Lori Bishop, and it would have created a competitive grant program through the Office of Public Assistance that would allow schools to apply for funds that would help pay for starting or expanding current purchasing of Montana grown or processed foods for their farm to school programs. HB 642 sought state appropriations in the amount of $200,000 over the biennium. The bill was heard in the House Education Committee where we had 13 witnesses testify in support of the bill uh, with several others sending in written testimony. We didn't have any opponents, but the bill was ultimately tabled in the committee. Cole Mannix was again our lobbyist working directly with Representative Bishop. And Cole's main takeaways uh, on this bill was that um, the reason it was tabled was we were really late in finding a sponsor on on the bill and getting it introduced. Um, with so many bills and getting late in the session, we were catching leg legislators who were beginning to have lower energy levels for issues that are less prominent and maybe a little bit controversial. There was also a sense that additional education with legislators around what farm to school is and how it functions needs to be done in order to get more bi bipartisan support. Other ideas Cole shared of how our coalition could better support a farm to school bill in the future is to build stronger partnerships with rural women, as well as engaging with the watershed and conservation districts. Cole also recommended that we should look at maybe asking for a, a, bigger, um, a bigger amount of more than $200,000, that that amount was perceived as ineffective in supporting uh, local farmers. I'll also just open it up for Rachel. I know that you worked closely on this bill too, if there was anything that you could add 
um, since Cole couldn't be here today. You covered it, Mara. Um, I think like you said, just like education and outreach based on the program um, for those legislators in the committee. And I do think that would make a significant difference. So yeah. Thank you. It looks like there was um, a question in the chat, Rachel, for opposition and committee. I think that was for cool. You want yeah, to I just messaged Aaron back. I okay. think I did it individually. So sorry about that. Great. Um, can you share what you what what you know what was the opposition and committee? Sure. Yeah. So there were just concerns that um, it was something that needed to be taken up at the federal level. Um, even though Montana had had it before at the state level. Um, and so that was, and there was like, there was like the Retailers Association and opposition along with um, Farm Bureau and stock growers. So those were the, the main opposition points. Were there any other questions or comments? On, on any of the um, on any of the policy priorities that we covered, um, we've got a few minutes. We're a little ahead of schedule, so if we can take some questions. Feel free to use the chat as well. Uh, this is Robin. I had asked Lorianne if uh, the comments in the governor's letter about the double snap uh, veto, if if those were if the reasons that were presented in the letter were. Uh, true or complete. And I'm just gonna ask Lorianne if she could uh, respond to that question. Yeah, good question. Thanks for helping to clarify that. I could have mentioned more about um, our thoughts on his reasons for vetoing. Um, so his two objections were that the double SNAP dollars program already has federal funds available and that SNAP, boot, SNAP benefits were already boosted due to the pandemic. Both of those things are true, but on their own should not be reasons to veto the legislation. So the federal funds that are available for double SNAP, as Ian mentioned, require a match, a one-to-one -one match. So the more state funds that are invested, the more federal funds we're able to leverage for our state. So to just say that there are federal funds available is very um, misleading. Those federal funds require a match and the state funds could have been that match. And then with the, the boosted benefits during the pandemic, yes, SNAP benefits were boosted during the pandemic. So one, that should be um, a great opportunity to incentivize folks to get to the farmer's market to spend those boosted benefits. Without double SNAP dollars, um, sort of the incentive to get to the market isn't necessarily there. It's you know, a whole extra stop to do your grocery shopping. It's not as available as a grocery store. A lot of people are still going to just go to the store for their, um, for their shopping. So double SNAP would bring those, those bigger benefit amounts to the market. But then more importantly, that boost was very short term. Um, so the biggest SNAP boost in Montana ended after the month of June this year, June 2021, although other states have maintained that boost, which is also something we're frustrated by. Um, but the biggest boost ended for folks earlier this summer. So saying that those benefits were boosted um, was a very short term response. Benefits do have a slight increase at this point, but it's still, I mean, it's not enough to keep up with the rising food costs. So, so we didn't feel like those reasons um, justified a veto at all. Great, thanks, Lorian. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, we're going to move on to the next uh, item on our um, program, which is- Laura, oh, sure. Steve, Steve has a question. Oh, I see. Sorry, I was looking away at my other screen. Steve, please go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. I'm not real. I was looking for the raise hand thing. I couldn't find it. Um, I have a question for Rachel. I'm also involved with him. A few, um, you know, this cool legislation, we had a lot of discussion about that recently. I wonder your, what your feelings are and whether it is better to focus our energies at the federal level than the state. Uh, sometimes we can you know, put so much energy into these things and maybe we could use it on something else if the federal uh, uh, route is the better way to go. Can you comment on that, Rachel? I definitely think it's important for the state level. I know it's really something that our membership's really super passionate about. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes we do see like a state push lead to a federal effort. 
Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it is important at the state level, but also very important at the federal level too. Um, but I don't, you know, I think it is still important to focus our energies here in the state too on the issue. Um, but, you know, now that we're out of the legislative session and we see this bipartisan push at the federal level, you know, at focusing energies there is, is valuable as well. So, and I, I don't know if that answers your question, Steve, but. Yeah, that, that's, you know, I, you know, sometimes you just don't want to let up. It's more about persistence. And I agree with that. Yeah. All right. Is there any other questions before we move on? Not seeing any hands raised. All right. Well, I think that's a great segue for our next um, our next item, um, which is a, a conversation on preparing ourselves, um, better positioning ourselves for the upcoming session, twenty twenty three, or in the future. Um, Rachel is going to give a, a, a small presentation and kind of lead this discussion. And so I will pass it over to you, Rachel. Rachel, you're on mute. So sorry. Um, so I'm just gonna offer some thoughts and you know, helping us all generate some more ideas and discussion around you know, positioning for the next legislative session. Um, so, and obviously like this is gonna be open for discussion in our breakouts. So this is not a definitive list. This is just to, to get us started. Okay, so post session, I think, you know, everybody looks at the, there's, you know, deep dives on legislative issues, but like, what can we be doing post session? You know, there's still interim committees going on. They're still taking up issues that are affecting Montanans. So, you know, continue making connections during the interim, you know, follow those interim committee meetings. Like right now there's a lot of ARPA dollars um, with these ARPA commissions, you know, following along with those is really critical. Um, keep up with what state agencies have going on. There's program building going on. There's rule reviews and changes and meetings. Like I know some of the state agencies are actually doing the red tape relief review and they're going through code and statute. So there's always opportunity to, you know, be involved and, and, you know, stay in the loop with that kind of stuff, even if it's not directly legislative. I mean, in a way it is, but um, stay apprised through any of those meetings through, you know, uh, email updates to the agencies or local organizations that you're a part of. Um, I think what's important post-session is like taking our goals that look to be accomplished and did we meet those goals? Yes, no, like building those listening groups and committee reviews within the organization to do that deep dive um, to help us see the pathway rather than just experience it. So what can we do next? I think, excuse me, I think a good step is identifying new goals and priorities, and it's okay if it's the same goals and priorities, um, but going through that process of talking through them again. Um, develop your talking points <clears throat> and continue to involve legislators and key stakeholders before the session is a really great and important step for prepping. Um, listening and having working groups on how to provide testimony, you know, training people ahead of time to help create that strong advocacy at the grassroots level. Um, this year, we are really fortunate to have the Zoom option at the legislative session, and I really think that will, that encouraged more participation statewide. Um, I hope it continues, um, but it is a little, you know, intimidating sometimes to get on and give testimony, so I think it's really important that we help our memberships, um, help people across the state, um, and go through like what it is to give testimony and, and you know, professionally and all that. Continue building up recognition for the issues that are important to organizations in our communities, um, on social media, working on awareness campaigns, just because the session's over doesn't mean the issue has to be over. So, um, you know, building up those relationships with legislators, if there's votes you can thank them for, or, you know, they've supported a program that's important to your organization, um, work on those relationships even outside of the session. Um, doing your homework on legislative issues is really important, knowing the votes if it's been a long-term legislative issue, knowing the best who you can, who's like the support, who's the opposition, um, knowing what your strengths are with the issue, speaking to what you're most familiar with and knowing what you know a legislator's background is in hopes that you can speak to something they're familiar with as well. And then 
actually, this was advice that I had gotten from Cole Mannix as he lobbied during the session as well. But he felt that physically being at the session, if possible, even if it's not an issue that your organization organization is working on, um, and just like getting to know the legislators is really valuable as well. Um, just another little thought is, you know, studying past versions of the bill, like Cool has had a couple different um, uh, bills in the legislature. I know Double Snap has had, like Lorianne and Ian were talking about. So I think it's really important you look at the approaches, like what has happened in the past, um, working to not, if there has been, if there have been mistakes, work to not repeat them. Um, and at the very least, that deep dive can help, you know, highlight some viable options for going forward with legislation. And then I think it's really important too to think big picture outside of just one legislative session. Like I think Double Snap is a great example. Like 2019, it was not successful, but when we looked at the big picture, we actually had a really successful push with it during this session. Um, and then also, you know, staying part of conversations at the state and federal level too, um, if it's applicable to the issue. So those are kind of my thoughts. I know that was really like fast and I had a ton of words on my screen, um, but hopefully that kind of helps get going with some conversation as we get into our breakout groups. Thanks, Rachel. Are there any initial uh, comments or thoughts or questions before we do head into those groups? Yeah, um, Maura, I, I'm gonna have to be, uh, bail out at 10, so I probably won't be in on the breakout group. So and I wanna make, reiterate a point Jim put in the chat uh, about the grain growers, the farm rear on that. Uh, it doesn't seem to me like we're doing enough to build a actual relationship with those groups. We kind of assume they're gonna be uh, opposed and, uh, and approach it from that standpoint. This is just my impression and I haven't been real involved. I know that the, the folks that are Cole and Rachel and all these people are, and are really into the, into the weeds on this stuff. But I just want to hope that point gets discussed in the breakout groups about somehow actually sitting down at the table with these guys, because I don't think, I, you know, I don't think they're that opposed to the logic we have. It's, uh, it's more of a, 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 a polarization issue. That's my thoughts anyway, if there, people want to comment now or wait till the breakout groups, that's fine. So I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Steve. That's a really that's a really important point, and I think it is something that's on the minds of um, the steering committee members of Grow Montana, and just you know hearing that feedback from from both Rachel and Cole. Um, and I think it's really something that Grow Montana is uh, really looking forward to this, this. How can we best use this off time in between the sessions to really build up those um, those conversations? We'll be talking a little bit more about um, the work Grow Montana has been doing outside of this session in our afternoon at 1 p.m. Um, session uh, later today, but um, really considering how we can build those, those relationships is definitely something that has been um, already put on the table. So it's good to hear that. And any ideas that people can share about how we can best do that, what's the most impactful. Uh, hopefully that's some of um, the content that can be shared in the breakout sessions. All right, any other initial comments or questions before we get a little ahead of schedule, but breakout sessions never seem like they last long enough. Um, so I'm okay with going ahead and opening those and I'm sure there's gonna be a little juggling that needs to happen. So um, we'll go ahead and move into that if that's okay with everyone. Hey Mara, will you share the- um, Yes, thank you. Perfect. Being in the chat, no, thank you. You could read my mind. Up. I appreciate the reminders. So um, everyone will have access to, I'm gonna drop this in the chat right now. This is the, uh, the facilitation guide, conversation guide um, that our, um, your breakout session leaders will be using, um, but you can also feel free to access it and add any comments um, so that you can all see the, the questions. 
Um, and really, I, and I shared this with our facilitators as well, um, these are just recommendations. So if your conversation expands past this or goes in a totally different direction, that's great. Um, we really wanna just emphasize the, um, the community building and, and conversations um, and, and just making those connections. So this, is, this truly is just a guide. Um, so the, the link's there. And I will go ahead and launch those breakout rooms. Steve, are you wanting to join a room or do you want to hop off the session now? I think I've tried to move you into one, so. And you're, you're on mute, sir. Yeah, I think um, since I got to leave in about five minutes, I'll just uh, take off now. Okay. Um, Please feel free to reach out with any other questions at any time to Grow Montana. I'd be happy to share your thoughts. So thank you for joining the questions. You bet. You bet. Super appreciate it. All right. Thanks for all you guys are doing. It sounds like you're pretty organized. <laughs> We're trying. Thank you. <laughs> all right. You have a good day.
Hey, Gail.
Gretchen, you had the whole CFAC crew. I know. <laughs> I know. I didn't plan it that way. It just happened. <laughs> yeah, Coulter too. He he was he 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 brought it a, a nice Coulter. perspective. <laughs> Thanks for taking notes, Ian. All right, I think everyone's back. Looks like we may have we may have lost some folks, but that's that's all right. Um, we have a few minutes to do some share out from your group, so I'm going to call on the facilitators. Um, but please, if you are in their group and you had something to share, feel free to to chime in as well. So we'll start with Group One, uh, Rachel. You want to share any? Um, themes or topics that that came out. Um, yeah, this. sure. So, and my group, feel free to hop in if I miss anything. Or um, so I think we we got to the first three questions. Had some very good conversation. Definitely um, for the food and ag issues, we talked a lot about like the importance of just value added local food production and processing, um, and you know support and education with growers and producers. Um, so those were kind of like a common theme in that first question. Um, and then the second question, um, how did you advocate, you know, just being involved with different local food organizations, um, you know, focusing with like community gardens and that kind of information, um, you know, touring, doing tours with, you know, family farming operations, um, seeing effects from, you know, exposing those operations and, and um, the different types of crops that are available also. Um, and if I'm, I'm messing anything up, group pop in. Um, and then just with like questions about, you know, legislature and advocacy, um, there were some thoughts about like what efforts have already been made to, you know, deepen and strengthen some of these or even build relationships with industry ag groups, um, knowing that we're going to be having some of these discussions as a steering committee. Um, and then just like running candidates that can be articulate and speak on value added production. Um, and then just how, like where do certain groups stand with partnerships and advocacy. So that's kind of what we talked about. Um, if I missed anything, pop in team. Great, thanks, Rachel. Um, next up, group two, and that was led by Jamie. Good morning. Thank you. We had um, a lot of food access folks in in our group, and and so that's what our conversation really did focus on was more food access and double snap, farm to pantry, farm to school. Um, and just supporting those initiatives at that level. There was a question about whether Grow Montana should, you know, pursue the ag related um, and uh, legislation just because it was not a great year um, for what initiatives we did work on. Um, however, we also recognize that that work like the soil health bill did have an outcome even if it wasn't legislation. Um, and then we also talked about um, building relationships now, looking at non-traditional partners. Um, and those non-traditional partners might be, um, you know, larger scale um, and whether that's working with the Farm Bureau or, you know, I potentially, you know, even we're reaching out to stock growers or grain growers or something like that. Um, and um, so yeah, doing the legwork now, keeping our memberships engaged and keeping our work going at the local level. Does that about cover it, gal guys, in group two? Great, thanks, Jamie. All right, we'll head over to group three with, uh, with Gretchen. So um, we spent some time talking about 
priorities and felt like, you know, they, the, the priorities are the right priorities that um, Grow Montana has been focusing on um, in understanding, um, you know, Ian also brought up the issue that I'm sure Lorianne brought up in the other session about pivoting um, double SNAP dollars to um, farm to food banks or farm to pantries. That concept, um, you know, made a lot of sense. Um, Coulter talked a lot about how, you know, the advocacy piece felt really hard um, from an individual standpoint. Um, and, you know, that we really need to look at how we engage earlier in these conversations. You know, one successful advocacy piece that worked really well with double SNAP dollars was bringing legislators to farmers markets and introducing them to um, SNAP recipients as well as farmers who um, benefit from the program and that they became really great advocates in the legislative session. So how do we look at that technique and um, use that moving forward. Um, you know, it's an individual arguing with a legislator on the merits of a bill doesn't feel very effective. So um, how can we do a better job of, you know, as was talked about earlier, um, you know, I think Jim and James talked about it. Um, how do we engage groups that maybe typically are against um, some of these ideas and engage them earlier in the conversation um, and potentially work together on something. Um, so those were kind of the main points. Um, we also talked about farm to school being a, an important focus for the next session. Everybody kind of agreed that that one was a good idea and maybe building off of the success of double snap dollars um, and thinking about an approach with farm to school, bringing legislators out to school gardens, trying to really um, help people understand the landscape of farm to school in the state of Montana, which is pretty amazing. Um, and, you know, put more education out there sooner than later so that um, as we go into the next session, we're better poised. If there's anything else to add, folks in my group, please speak up. Thanks. Thanks, Gretchen. We're almost at the end, so I want to give a chance for group four with Robin um, to share anything out before we adjourn. I'll share out for our group. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a, uh, I'll keep it short, but we had a really wide range of interests in our group um, from climate change adaptation, which is the research that I do um, among the agricultural community to uh, food access, food security, food sovereignty, and supporting community engagement in local food initiatives. Um, and I think the one common denominator though among our group was that we, we feel like relationship building is really the key to advocate for all the, all the issues that we care about. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about, um, I guess I raised sort of the question of how, how much does legislature interact with producers themselves and who's kind of not engaging from the producer end and who's not being heard, that type of thing. Um, and just generally speaking, we feel like ongoing relationship building. Um, so throughout the year and in person as much as possible is really uh, key to advancing all of the, all of the advocacy activities we're, we're doing. Great, thank you, Ada, and everyone for sharing out and for those taking great notes. Um, this is going to be very useful to our coalition as we as we continue to plan our next steps. Um, so, just in the last minute or so, uh, I invite you all to join our afternoon session at 1 p.m. If you're interested in learning more about our member and ally survey that we conducted this um, this summer and the recommendations that we're putting forth to our coalition. Uh, on our next steps, um, sort of on internal um, processes for the coalition. And I'll put my email in the chat. Um, if you have any questions or um, would like more information about um, Grow Montana, feel free to reach out to me directly. And I think that pretty much concludes. Um, if there's any final comments or questions, I don't know, Robin, if you had anything else to share. And you're, yeah, there you go. Uh, I think we're complete. Just, um, 
another plug for the rest of Expo. If you have not had a chance to review the rest of the agenda, please do so. And I look forward to seeing everybody at the one o'clock session. Great. Thanks, everybody.